much, Hans, um, for the opportunity to present again some findings that we put together here at CEP following up on the great work of our colleagues, Thorsten Hindrichs and uh, Mr. Kreta. Um, some of you might wonder why, especially after Hans brought up my bio, uh, there's a lot of Islamist extremism focus there. And that is because CEP actually has both phenomena uh, as, uh, let's say, target groups, as Hans mentioned in the introduction. But this also led to us as CEP realizing that there seems to be a, a, a lack of follow the money approach when addressing violence-oriented right-wing extremism or right-wing extremism in general. Um, and this will be uh, the focus uh, of, of the presentation from my end. Um, we, I guess we brought a different perspective into the discussion because, because of course, the work of uh, Thorsten Hindrichs and Herr Kreta show that there has been extensive research done before, but in terms of looking for network activities and structures, it seems that that was not so much the case. And especially the security services seem to have focused on party financing, far-right extremist party financing, and a narrative that these are all self-funded actors. And this might still be true to a degree, but um, uh, we have uh, figured out that, uh, that they're a part of the milieu, especially those with a transnational dimension, have moved from amateurs to professionals. Uh, as I said in the past, the, the uh, analysis was these guys uh, give blood donations, receive uh, 30 euros to buy the bus ticket to go to the march against foreign infiltration or whatever. And that's still probably the case to some degree. That's not our focus. Our focus at CEP are the movers and shakers, the generals and architects and propagandists who provide the milieu, which then generates again violence, what we sometimes call lone actors that are not involved in a command structure, but feel that they're part of a bigger movement and have an urge to act due to, for example, the Great Replacement and other uh, key apocalyptic narratives. So no follow the money approach was something we found curious. And that's why we uh, highlighted this in our work, especially also last year. And the positive response was that um, the, um, uh, the conference of the German ministers of the interior put the investigation of extreme right-wing financial networks on the agenda uh, two months after we published our report. So that's very positive. And also they uh, put in a working group, which is supposed to pre present the findings this week about uh, if their knowledge and approach is still um, up to speed. So strategies, there are several, as I mentioned, and others, the self-financing, uh, financing, donations, cryptocurrencies, concerts, festivals, stores and shops, combat sports events with up to 800 visitors uh, generate also 20, 30,000 euros and more in turnover, real estate, at least 170 uh, pieces of real estate um, are owned or operated or um, uh, easily accessible for far-right extremists in Germany. Uh, there's a, another number that is much higher, but that's the official one. And there is organized crime. Some of the key actors have strong ties to, let's say, biker gang-oriented, Julian-affiliated far-right extremists, where the political and the crime merge into one. So, why do we think that there is a financial network, despite the fact that the scene, the far-right extremist scene in Germany, for example, and beyond, pretends to be a bunch of amateurs basically um, spending what they're earning, so making no profits uh, to, to fund the scene in a significant way. We found that there's a lot of cooperation between uh, key actors. For example, there's a legal advice um, there, there's a bunch of lawyers easily accessible for everyone in this milieu. There is IT security uh, accessible for the specific, more professional, more transnational oriented milieu. Um, there's various uh, shared content, of course, between supposedly independent telegram channels and some of the stores, uh, a surprising number, operate on the same e-commerce provider, 
uh, despite the fact that there's a wide variety of free e-commerce providers, it seems that there's also been some cooperation, not necessarily with the provider, but in terms of exchanging good business practices. So our question was, uh, is it really that there are no financial networks and that there's no, let's say, a planned tax evasion here? And this is why we have put forward a couple of suggestions on how to dive into these networks, because so far the investigations in this field focus on the individual case, the person and the prose uh, prosecution of that person. When there's a group like Combat 18, of course, they look into the network and financial activities of Combat 18 directly, the illegal ones but they don't include the legal activities. Almost all of these actors have various businesses. And since there's so much cash changing hands and so little transparency and uh, the, the business models, the structures of the companies are oriented towards minimal transparency. So we think there's something to be found. And that's why we have pushed this forward in the report that Marco just has put in the chat. Another point is the infrastructure on the big social media platforms. There's a narrative that they've moved away uh, due to deplatforming and are now all on Telegram and Gap and other platforms. But we have found out that there seems to have been a change in strategy for some of the key actors, a strategy of extreme normalization, meaning they are not violating uh, terms of service in terms of hate speech, but they're promoting their stores and shops and commercial activities on those big platforms. So this is not about illegal content or banned groups. This is about the movers and shakers, the generals and architects of the violence-oriented transnational milieu that are often still present on the big platforms. They just pretend to be nice. So they focus on their economic interests, on their martial arts associations, music labels, and so on, and so on, on the big platforms. They are the entrepreneurs of extremism. And the terms of service of some uh, platforms, especially Facebook and Instagram, is definitely violated because they say, it's one company, um, that white supremacy groups are not allowed on the platform and that Facebook and Instagram are also looking into offline activities, yet they are present uh, there. And I'm going to show you briefly what we found. There's another uh, report that uh, Marco is uh, sharing with you. So we identified the top 100. We made a mapping exercise. We put in different factors. What makes an actor a key actor? And we put the 100 for Germany in a list and then checked who is on Facebook, who is on Instagram, who is on YouTube, and who is on Twitter. 54 profiles with 267,000 subscribers on Facebook, 37 profiles with 82,000 uh, 82, followers on Instagram, YouTube, 33 profiles with 9.5 million views of the videos shared there. And Twitter is not that popular, maybe because you can't make that much money using Twitter. So what is the extreme normalization? You see here uh, Tommy Frank that was mentioned before by presentation of Herrn Kreta, I think, a key actor of organizing transnational events, selling merchandise. This is what he's sharing on his profiles. Kissing dolphins, the nice violence-oriented far-right extremist. But on his web shop, you can buy um, uh, weapons, um, and uh, steel helmets and knives and uh, military grade pepper spray. So his profile on Facebook looks very friendly and one click away, you go into this kind of prepper militant way, uh, world. You have Kampf der Nibelungen, a martial arts association promoting t-shirts here with a female fighter that actually is fighting at Kampf der Nibelungen, a transnational mar mixed martial arts event. You have uh, clothes for children also uh, on, on those media directing them to the stores that offer other equipment as well. And here you see a transnational um, picture, basically. You have the, the German Kampf der Nibelungen, the guys in the green shirts. You have Vardon 21, which is a, a straight edge uh, um, mixed martial arts group from Germany. You have Pride France and you have Father Frost, which is a Russian mixed martial arts far-right extremist groups. So they are 
connected and they are all on these platforms. Not all, every group is on all platforms, but they are all on the mentioned four platforms. You have the what was described before, the event orientation, and you have a connection to organized crime with uh, Brotherhood Turinga, which were arrested a few months ago due to uh, possession and dealing with illegal drugs, illegal prostitution, violence, and so on. And the point here is that they have not moved away. They have adjusted the strategy, and it is for us now to adjust our strategy as well. There's algorithmic extremism in a way that you what you see here is that Facebook recommends to me a far right extremist prepper store, the vorgeschlagene Seiten means recommended page. And here in the red cycle, you see another uh, crossbow, uh, a daily offer to buy this uh, crossbow extra cheap from a far right extremist store for far right extremists. So we need to talk about values, free speech, yes, but this is not about free speech. It is about freedom to do business, which is a right as well. So the companies decide with whom they do business. We need to advance the perspective of um, governance uh, discussions, EU Internet Forum, for example, on um, to also look at the offline activities of groups and individual and not just the online and the EU Digital Services Act might provide the uh, opportunity to mandate platforms to enforce their own community standards, right? So if they say we don't allow for white supremacy groups, but they do allow for white supremacy groups, can users sue them and make them kick these players off? That's something, uh, a legal question that is unclear, but uh, should be definitely uh, supported and put forward from my perspective. Thank you.